welcome to the show and thank you for taking the time. There's a lot of podcasts out there to listen to, so I appreciate you checking out mine. Hey, real quick, if you don't mind hitting that like button if you're watching on YouTube and also subscribing to my YouTube channel, I would really appreciate that. We just hit 600 subscribers today and my goal is to hit 1,000 by the end of the year. Um, so hopefully we get there. Uh, now then, let's talk about my guest. He is well over that 1,000 subscriber mark. He has millions of listeners on his podcast, The SDR Show. Ralph Sutton is here today. And besides The SDR Show, he also hosts another podcast about health and wellness called The Good Sugar Podcast. So you may also remember him from his old radio show, The Tour Bus, where they interviewed a lot of uh, 80s rock guys and had a lot of 80s rock music stuff going on. Um, and he's also done work with VH1, Metal Edge Magazine, and he was on an episode of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And he's got some great stories to tell about music and also uh, computer hacking, run-ins with 9-11 hijackers, all the celebrity guests he's had on his show, uh, the stupid reason they're, that their Instagram got taken down, and so much more. So enjoy. Welcome, Ralph Sutton, to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you, sir. I was like perusing your archives, and you have a lot of my friends on the show with Dee Snyder, Carrie Kelly, Jizzy Pearl, a lot of good peeps on your show. Oh, yeah, 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 because you do a lot of the 80s rock. I used, I had a, a rock radio show for, uh, I don't know, 18, 19 years. We were on about 100 stations. and The tour bus, right? Then, yeah, the tour bus. So we interviewed all of those people, like uh, uh, Janie Lane, who unfortunately no longer with us, but all the guys in Warren. I see that over your right shoulder. Oh, they yeah. came in and performed a bunch of times. Really good guys. Yeah, all of them are good guys. I love, yeah, I've had Eric and Joey. So what was it like interviewing Janie then? Because I've never obviously gotten the chance to, because by, by the time I started this, he had passed away, so... You know what was cool? So um, he, they came in studio and performed live, which was great. And uh, excuse me, <coughs> they um, they did like a medley of I Saw Red and uh, Blind Faith. And they also did Uncle Tom's Cabin and just cool dudes. And what's funny, this is how you always know when a guy has a good sense of humor and can be take themselves not too seriously. So I, big fan of 80s rock, un unabashedly so huge fan of everything 80s. Me too. My um, intern, or I forget who it was at the time, when a uh, couple weeks earlier, we were playing I Saw Red, and I was singing my heart out, but obviously my mic wasn't on because it was during their show, mm -hmm. but you could still record the mic even if it wasn't being played out. So my, okay. my intern thought it would be funny and recorded me, who cannot sing, destroying <laughs> the song, right? Yeah. And changing the lyrics to be offensive or just being stupid, you know? I think I said at the end, I hate you, you fucking bitch, or something like that. It's just being ridiculous, <laughs> you know? And... Um, we played it for Janie afterward. Like there was, oh, I want to hear. Want you to hear my version. Some people would get shitty and be like, um, "Oh, how dare you?" And blah blah blah. This, that's my music. Mm -hmm. But he just started laughing. He's like, "Dude, you really can't sing, can you?" Like, no, I can't. And so when people can laugh at themselves, it makes me like them a lot better. You know? Yeah. And then a sad story is maybe a week before he died. Um, I, I could be wrong on the dates a little bit, but he called me. By accident, he had my number on his phone. We had talked a few times, but hmm. he called me by accident to apologize for getting drunk on stage at a um, Steel Panther show. Okay. And he dialed my number by accident. And I'm like, ah, oh, you got the wrong guy, man. Uh, you, you meant to call uh, Michael Starr, but you called me. I guess Starr Sutton, who knows, hmm. dialed me by accident. He's like, oh, sorry, dude. All right, I got to go call him. And then he passed away like a few days later, which oh, was really sad. So fuck. I just, uh, I did speak to him a few days before he passed. That's crazy. So it sounds like maybe he was trying to make amends a little bit. Yeah, he was definitely trying to make amends. That's, that, that's crazy. Definitely, definitely in my mind. And I spoke to Michael Starr about it uh, a few years later, and he said it was something to do with an ex-girlfriend or some crazy nonsense, but it was, yeah, he was calling him to apologize. Okay. Yeah, I love Steel Panther, too. They're one of my favorite. I've probably yeah. seen them like 30 times or something. My girlfriend's so sick of seeing them because I always drag I her to them. the shows. Sad that uh, what's his name left the band. Uh, yeah, do you know the, the story behind that? By the way, like I don't. I don't. You know, okay. I texted Michael, but uh, he probably doesn't have the time to talk about it right now. But um, I'm sure there's a, a valid reason. They've been they've all been such good friends for so long. A crazy side story. In 2001, I was in L.A. for the Rockstar movie premiere. Right, Steel Panther played the after party. Mm. Right, and they, I, I had heard of them. They were going by Metal School or Metal Stuff. They, before Metal School, they were called something else, but Metal Something, whatever. I don't remember, but it was before they changed to Steel Panther. And it was an amazing after party. LL Cool J sang a, a Poison song or Def Leppard. It was Zach Wilde got up. It was just a crazy time, right? 
And I had never seen them before. And after the show, I wanted to say, look, guys, you don't know me, but I have a, a, a big radio show in, in New York. I would like to fly you guys into New York to do a string of dates in New York, New Jersey, I th- in, uh, Long Island. I think we can make money with you guys as a live event from my show and introduce you guys to the East Coast. They had never played the East Coast before. Wow. And that's what we did. We did a show in Jersey, a show in Long Island, and I forget what the, the third show I think was like in upstate New York. I forgot where, but we did three dates. No one had ever heard of them before. The only people there were fans of my radio show. I did not tell them that it's what it was. You know what I mean? You're just coming to see a band. And back then, there was not a lot of internet, so they couldn't just look them up. Mm. And that they will tell you, if you ever interview them on the show, that that was what introduced them to the East Coast. Nobody knew who they were then. That's amazing. So then you get free tickets for life after that? For life. Yeah, they, I was supposed to be in like three or four of their videos, and every oh. time they've invited me to be in a video, I've had a personal tragedy. So I asked them to stop inviting oh. me to be in videos because my dad died. I thought I had throat cancer. Like one thing after the other. I was like, just don't ask me to be in videos anymore because I make plans, and then that happens. Wait, I'm sorry to hear that. Wait, tell me the story about the throat cancer. What, why did you oh, think I you had throat a, cancer? Uh, a, I had a big nodule appear underneath my chin, and we got it. Uh, the biopsy came back inconclusive. So I said, well, just take it the fuck out. Like, I don't want to wait and find it. Oh, what, it's cancerous. Yeah. So at the time, I was a, a VJ for VH1 Classic. And um, I had to, which is still to this day, one of the most annoying stories of my life. Um, me and Eddie Trunk would go week after week. I'd do week A, he'd do week B. And we would both be VJs on VH1 Classic. Yeah, didn't you guys I have tried, a rivalry or something? We did. Yeah, we did. And uh, this was like in the midst of that. But... um. He does at this point, like he did much better than me. So kudos to him. It doesn't really <laughs> fucking matter, you know. Yeah. But at this point, um, I was in week A, he was in week B. So we'd both go in for one day every two weeks and tape for like eight hours, and then you'd be on that week and then whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So I tried to do the right thing because as I was new to this, has only been doing it for like maybe five months at that point. And I said, listen, I have potential throat cancer. I have to go in for surgery. I may not be able to record. In two weeks, when my next one comes up, I'm going for surgery tomorrow. I just want to give you a heads up because I need to get this taken care of. Mm -hmm. And the guy that ran VH1 Classic said, ah, don't worry. You'll have a place here. We love you, blah, blah, blah. Of course, they give the full-time gig to Eddie. He took it. I lost the job. Never worked in VH1 again. That's my story. But so I Uh also, had I not said anything, I healed up in time. And those I timed it to be the day after the show. Mm -hmm. So I had two weeks to heal. I would have been fine and shows you sometimes in, in, in entertainment, you don't do the right thing. I was trying to be nice and let them know they need coverage for just one time. And they didn't do it for me. Wow. Well, how did you even get that? The gig initially though, to work for VH1? Cause that's even to the, you still have that on your resume. I mean, you didn't get the full time right. thing, but. Um, so I had the show, the radio show, and it's actually, it's funny. It had nothing to do with the radio show. I was, hmm. um, I had done a couple of the like talking head stupid things like the top 100 worst metal videos of all time or the whatever. Mm -hmm. I did a couple of those. But then I was also a DJ at a strip club. And one day this guy comes up to me and goes, why don't you work for me? And I said, I don't know. Who the fuck are you? Like, what are you talking (laughs) about? He he ran VH1 Classic. And I was like, I don't know, man. Because at the time I had long hair. I was a real rock and roll guy. He said, you should be on, on my network. I'm like... Dude, I, I would love to be on your network. And literally, like two weeks later, I started working there. That's how it happened. I had nothing to do with the radio show whatsoever. Okay. And then I just, you know, whatever happened, I lost, I lost a job. It just sucks. That sucks. Well, you said you mentioned the uh, strip club DJ thing. Um, can you tell my audience this story about the 9 11 hijackers? That, that, oh, that is, I know well, it's a rerun for you, but like oh, I, th- I found fine. this fascinating. No, you know, new people that listen to every show. It's fine. Yeah. No problem. So I always have, and this is a running gag on my podcast, is that. There's a lot of weird stories that have happened to me. I'm 51. I've done a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. You just find yourself in odd. Everybody, the older you get, the more stories you're going to have. That's just It is what it is. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so on the Saturday before 9-11, which is, it was on a Tuesday, so four days prior, um, I DJed for the 9-11 terrorists, the ones that took the boat and the boat, the plane to uh, the Pentagon, not the ones that went to... Uh, the uh, two towers, right? Okay. So first of all, the cra- the way we knew that that happened was two or three days after the FBI came, they had the credit cards on file, they had some camera footage, and they were able to verify that 100% it was them, right? And I found an article 
because my co-host didn't believe me when I told him. And even though it's 20 years ago, I was able to find an article that said uh, staff at a Wayne, New Jersey strip club uh, interviewed about te- uh, the, the terrorists being there before 9-11. So I could show, oh, look, it did, it did happen, right? But the crazy two parts of that story, the two little anecdotes was when they were leaving, one of the girls, well, first, one of the girls said, what do you do for a living? Mm-hmm. And the guy said he was an airline pilot. Yeah. And then when he was leaving, which at the time she looked at, what the fuck is this guy talking about? As he was leaving, he said to the girl, stay out of New York next week, which is... And it, That's like, crazy. Like, yeah. And that, that's just crazy. That was the story. Just a wild... You know, at the time, it made no sense. And then the FBI came in to question us all. And I remember they brought me into the room. And I'm like, look, I could tell you what song they like. I don't know how that's going to help your investigation. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I know. Yeah, so I, I think... I didn't speak to them at all. Yeah, the fascinating thing about that to me is that... I feel like isn't that against their religion to go to strip clubs? It was the same with Obama, uh, not Obama, Osama bin Laden. When they caught him, they found porn and stuff. I was like, wait, I thought yeah. this like whole Muslim thing was like you're not supposed to have porn and strip. Like I well, thought that I was. I can tell you that after doing I don't know 12, 15 years, I don't know how many years I was a strip club DJ. One of the biggest subsets of customers were Hasidic Jews, hmm. the, the most commonly uh, known to get thrown out for being. Uh, inappropriate and doing things offensive were Hasidic Jews that are supposed to be 100% abstaining from shit like that. <laughs> so I think in yeah. general, in life, and I, I don't mean to piss off anybody that's listening, I always feel the more vehemently you're against something, like if you're a staunch yeah. anti-whatever, there's something in your closet. You know, if you really hate gay people, you're struggling with something inside. That's what I think it is. If you really are against uh, premarital sex, you're seriously desiring it and fighting your own demons and it's surfacing as negativity. And that's how I look at it. I think if you're that against something that is, there's nothing really wrong with. You no, know definitely. I mean? There's, there's definitely a principle there, but um, so you talk about the FBI and stuff, but that wasn't your first run in with the FBI. So tell my audience this story. There's another crazy story. I'm like, this guy does have a lot of crazy stories in, in his closet. Yeah. So, um, the, the, so the crazy tie in is this. So I'll tell you this. It started out, when I, I left elementary school and entered high school, my elementary school was very small. 100 kids in first to eighth grade. Each group was like seven, eight kids, 10 kids in each, in each class. My graduating class was six or seven people, and two of them were my brother and I. I have a twin brother, right? Mm. So they're so small, these classes. Then I go into high school. High school had 4,000 kids. It was a culture shock to me. You know, all of a sudden, every race, every religion – thousands of people it was it was overwhelming it was it was great to be in like the real world but it was overwhelming and my first niche or the first group of people that i got into which is hilarious was the breakdancing crowd right and i was in a breakdancing movie i used to uh break dance to make money it was a crazy crazy thing right that's from ninth grade to like 10th grade and then at the beginning of 10th grade i made this bizarre 180 switch into computers for some reason i felt oh this is going to be the future it was 1984-85 at the time Mm -hmm. i'm like this is going to mean something i took a typing class where i was the only guy in the typing class at the time it was only secretaries that took typing classes you know and i started to learn basic computers then got a modem which at the time i don't know how well you how well versed you are in tech but my first modem was a 300 baud modem which Nowadays, you're talking in gigabits of download of download speed. One gigabit is a thousand uh, bits, you know, and then sorry, it's a hundred thousand, then a thousand, and then you go down to uh, each thousand, then three hundred subs of that. It was only text. There was nothing else, and it was mm. slow text on the screen. Sure, crazy slow connection, right? And you're using but, the actual phones that you'd put yeah, the into phone, the. Yeah. And you had to make sure no one was on the phone, and blah blah blah. And we just, my brother and I, got good at doing like rudimentary hacking like changing grades um see i didn't even know schools use uh internet they just started to they just started to that's pretty revolutionary Uh, i thought the internet really didn't hit until the 90s well it wasn't internet there was no internet it was dial-up so right okay the way i describe the the best analogy like a a train station is more like an internet meaning that you could stay on that train system and keep going from location to location you're on that system an internet you know a, a connection of travel ways okay dial-ups were like an uber where you can only go from one point to the other uh, and you're the only one in that point at the time okay no one else could be on that website it's called the bbs at the time no one else could be in that bulletin board 
but you. When you disconnect, someone else can go in, hmm. just like an Uber, where a train has thousands of people. You know, so that's the difference, right? So I would log into a we- uh, not a website, but a bulletin board, and we would do things like change grades or or uh, buy something and then re- send the money, the bill to someone else, whatever, just dumb shit. Change my phone bill to five dollars, whatever. <laughs> um, and then we would do this thing where. Keep in mind, this is 1985. It was new technology. Yeah. Conference calling. So I had just yeah. graduated elementary school, and I would get these conference calls together of all my old friends from elementary school, like 15 of us on a call, where we'd all be talking, like a party line, right? But those calls in 1985 would be like $5,000 because that technology was only for corporations. Mm. And then we would just charge it to some random corporation. We were kids doing stupid shit. Oh, you know? my God. And then it got to be pretty somebody, smart to figure this shit out, though. How did you just that, figure it, it out? Sounds more. It just figure it out. You know, there huh. was, it wasn't like now. It seems I complicated. That. It's not that it, then now it's complicated because now yeah. there's ways to tra- trace you and track mm. what you're doing. Then it really wasn't. It was like the example I give is when Bluetooth first came out. Right. I had a stupid app on my phone and it was called like Blue Sniff. And it was a free app I found online. And all it would do is sniff a public place for open Bluetooth channels. Nobody put a password on their Bluetooth <laughs> when it first came out. And I could like listen on conversations. I could send them messages. I could do whatever I wanted. It was just so stupid because it was a new technology. Nobody knew what to do with it. So mm. that's what was happening back then. Right. Nobody really knew that, oh, we should really put good passwords on here. Not like a password, like the word password or whatever. It was so easy to get into these systems back then. Right. And uh, then somebody else got caught doing the conference call thing and they get, were about to get arrested and the the person said oh you don't want me you want to go after this guy because he's the one that got me the information and blah. Mm. so they abused it we didn't abuse it we'd use it once in a while they went crazy they got busted oh. and then they ratted me out and we were so stupid my brother and i that our cracking name like for stealing um you crack video games and you put them out on the on the bulletin boards it was the Sutton brothers. We used our <laughs> real name. That's how stupid we were. You know, yeah. we didn't know it was such a, we were such neophytes to that world. We didn't think anything of it at the time. But yes, I was questioned by the FBI that time. My dad had to get us a lawyer. We got off because we were 15 and, you know, we were just idiots. So it wasn't like it was too new of a technology. We just got. Did you have to pay warning. back any of the money, though, or anything? Or What happened was we were told there was going to be a $300,000 fine and a two year probation. But honestly, I don't really know what happened. My father got us a good lawyer. Mm. We went in for a few meetings, and then like six months later, we found out that it was dropped. Okay, that's all I know. Well, that's that's a crazy. That you got kind of lucky. I feel like nowadays yeah. they would oh, not yeah. go so easy on oh, people yeah, like for that. Sure, and it's only because it was so new. Just like at the beginning of um, MP3 sharing, everybody would have every oh, song yeah. ever and sharing it, and then one day they decided, okay. Now we need to make an example out of somebody. And you just, if you were before that time, you got away with murder. And then after that time, you're like, oh, shit, we can't do that anymore. Right, yeah. So then, uh, you know, you did the music thing, and then uh, you've written for some websites. And I thought I read that you wrote for Metal Edge. What did you I write did for Metal for Edge? Which, or did you do interviews, or what did you do? You know, what I did was, so when the, at one point, my radio show got pretty popular, mm-hmm. right? After Queer Eye, um, which I was a, uh, uh, a contestant i guess you'd say I don't <laughs> it was a, a subject I a don't guest yeah a guest you know on queer eye for the straight guy and just did the reunion a few months ago which was nice to have me hmm. on but um they um that the show exploded we got on like we were close to 100 stations i always change the number a little bit because i didn't know the exact number in radio syndication it would change every week new show station would come on old stations would leave you'd never get an exact number but around 90 95 stations were the most we got to but um at the time, I was friends with some of the people in Metal Edge, and it just became a co-pro, you know, like a, a, a promotion that we collaboratively worked on where I would talk about Metal Edge magazine on my radio show mm. in exchange for writing an article in Metal Edge and mm. plug my radio show. So very often it would be like talking about events that I hosted, talking about a new album, talking about a guest that came on the show, and it was a monthly article that I would just put out. I think we did about a year of them. Oh, Okay. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, hosting events. What is your strategy when you're hosting those events? Like, do you write jokes and material or interesting facts, or do you just go up there and riff and tell the crowd to get louder? Or what do you do when well, you? I am usually given the worst task in the business. Right? <laughs> okay. Is, 
you have there's always going to be like rules and regulations to follow you know the guy like the classic oh, uh, shit. woodstock like the red acid's been poisoned whatever that clip is from the original woodstock we don't eat the, don't eat the red acid whatever the <laughs> fuck it was right <laughs> the guy that has to go up and give the bummer announcements is usually my task you oh, know, the guy shit. that is going on stage and just making announcements it's also changed a lot in the past i've been doing this 20 years right mm. so 20 years ago every band didn't have an intro tape you know, every band didn't have certain things that they wanted. You just went up and said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Motley Crue, whatever, and they mm. come out. That doesn't really happen anymore. Now mm. they all want their special introies. So you really do like, you're talking five minutes before the show, the band comes on. You're not talking as the band's coming out, which is always more exciting. Hmm. But you have to give the shitty announcements. Don't do this. Don't film that, mm. that. And you just try to make it entertaining. The story that I tell often was... um, I was hosting Ship Rocked one year. I did that for 10 mm -hmm. years. And um, the band Hell Yeah was the opening band. And the opening is that it was a standard routine every year. Everybody gets on the boat during the day. They get drunk. And at 5 o'clock, it's hot as shit out. It's leaving from Fort Lauderdale or Miami. And the horn would blow on the uh, ship. The boat leaves port. And the band comes out and plays. And it's how it starts. It does it every year. Everyone goes crazy. And I mean, it was Five Finger Death Punch. Holy shit, right? Right when they were huge, five, six thousand people. And right before that moment, the uh, guys who run Shiprock come up to me and like two or three of the other hosts, because there's always multiple bands, said, Look, there's going to be about a 45 minute to an hour delay. The band is not ready. The music, the sound's not ready. You have to go up and kill time, or else there's going to be a riot because everyone's drunk. Right. So I'm like, all right, what are you going to do? Let's do this. And then there were two other hosts. One was from Sirius XM. One was, I forget who, whatever. And they're like, no, I, I'm going to get killed. This is what one of the girls said. I'm not doing it. I'm like, well, this is what we're here for. We got to yeah. be, we are, no one's going to remember the band showed up late. They're going to remember that jackass that talked for 40 minutes. Like they think I'm killing time and trying to be fun. Like, why isn't this guy getting off stage? They don't have to know. The band's not ready. They just know that I talk too much. I'll take yeah. the heat for that. I don't care. You're you know? laying on the grenade for them. Right, exactly. So I went up, and I mean, we were playing, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. We were doing state trivia. I mean, anything and anything I could come up with oh to kill God. 45 minutes of time, and then finally the band went on, you know? Okay. And nobody cared. No, Nobody blamed the band, the band at the end right. of it, and it just worked out. It was great, but that's the kind of shit I do, you know? Yeah. You have to go up, and it's a different mindset than being like a comedian or even being like a host at a show because you have to get everyone to pay attention to non the things that they don't want to pay attention to and mm. one time like big j my co-host on sgr mm -hmm. we were both hosting separate events and he's not good at it and he hates it right <laughs> it's a di different thing so i just left some event and i get a message on my phone please help and i go into this studio that he's in in the, in the room that he's in and he's on stage like this looking at me <laughs> There's just people screaming around him. He doesn't know what to do. It was for a beer pong. Mm -hmm. Mike, just give me the mic. And I like kick this person out, get this person in. And you're out, you're done. You're good. And then within two minutes, the game was going. You know, like, hmm. sometimes they just need, and I know it's because they have a big, very booming, authoritative voice. Yeah. People will listen to you and just let's just do this and go. You know? And he hates doing shit like that. A lot of people hate doing shit like that. And I don't mind being the heavy. Okay. It sounds like you're almost like I used to work in education. So it sounds like you're more like a principal or like a teacher. That's how I look at it. Yeah. yeah. We try to be lighthearted and fun and try to make it not too authoritative. Right. And just be fun. You know, are those pretty lucrative gigs? I mean, like you hosted M3 and Shiprocked and Sturgis. I mean, those are pretty big gigs. Yeah, Is that a lucrative are, thing for are, you? Shiprocked was a very financially uh, beneficial. A lot okay. of them you do to promote your show or promote your name. You know, like to me, for years, my philosophy was as long as I'm not losing money, I'll do it. If they're mm -hmm. going to pay my way, pay my food. Give me just enough money to live every day. I'll do it. I mm -hmm. don't care. But at this age, that fact that I'm, you know, I'm 51. Yeah. I said to a couple of these things that I used to host for years, like, you know, there's some 25 year old kid that would give his right arm to host this fucking thing. And I'm doing it out of feelings of obligation. Hmm. So maybe look to someone else at this point, because. I'm more happy staying home and going to bed early at this point in my life. Right. You know? You're getting kind of tired of hosting the events because it's, it's repetitive and yeah. And yeah, I just also, how much it like for me, like, I'm sure, and I can't say for sure, I hosted Shiprock for 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Last year was their 11th one. I didn't do it. I took a year off. I'm guessing they're going to ask me to do it again. I could be wrong. I don't know if I want to do it again. I just don't. You know, mm -hmm. 10 years, there's something to say about that. 
It was great. I did it. Loved it. Awesome. Can't say anything but nice things about those guys. But at this point, to do a week at sea, I run a network now. I do my shows. and mm-hmm. I have all the other sh- obligations. It would have to be a lot more money for me to make it make sense in my head. Right. And I don't know if that's fair to them. Sure. Either. You know, so I, I, I don't know the right answer. No, I think that's good, though. If you if somebody else, like you said, they really want to do it and they're more driven and more passionate about that. And you're kind of like, I've been there, done that. It makes right. more sense. Um, yeah, I would rather spend a few hours working on my next episode or, or prepping for an interview yeah. and go, trying to be healthy. And you're not healthy on the boat. You're drinking every fucking right. day. You're, you're not sleeping. And I feel like you need a week recovery after a week at sea every time. Oh, totally. Yeah. So since you've done a lot of these uh, music events with, and there's always tons of bands, I see the lineups, mm-hmm. there's always like the big ones and there's also the, the younger ones. Um, what newer or younger ba- rock bands have kind of caught your ear? Like who is the next generation of rock bands that you like? So the band I just, it's, it's a one guy, but it's, it, I just had him on and he's really interesting because he's doing a unique thing. Uh, the name of the band is Grandson. They're actually going to be hmm. on Shiprock this year. Okay. And he blends different genres together. It's like hip hop, but it's rock. It's clearly rock. Uh, some of them have like uh, almost like dubstepy elements to it. Okay. Um, hmm. And he is doing his own thing. It's a very unique vibe, but it caught my attention. And I was like, oh, this guy is cool. We just had him on STR. Cool. Um, and I give him credit for, you know, because look, I hate to say this. You're obviously a rock fan. Sure. I'm imagining as well. Yeah. The, the D Snyders and the Jizzy Pearls of the world, they're never going to be in the front and center again. Rock right. and roll in its pure form had a great run. Mm-hmm. It's basically for 40 years, rock mattered, you know, mm-hmm. which is no other style of music can say that except pop music because it's technically popular of the moment. That's a different analysis. But rock and roll... Guitars, bass, drums, vocal. Or metal never, or hard rock. Yeah, or, yeah, Any one of them. They're never going to be mainstream again. It's never happening. So stop saying this is the band. Oh, Greta Van Fleet's going to bring back rock and roll. Oh, Buck Cherry's going to bring back rock and roll. Silver Tide. It's not happening, right? There will be bands that will get more popular, but they're not going to be played on the Z100s of the world next to the newest Taylor Swift or Olivia Rodrigo song. It's not happening, right? So what I like to find are bands that have figured out a way to make rock elements in like falling in reverse. Another great example of a hmm. band that figured out a way to modernize their sound with some rap elements and some like techno or dancey elements and even metals in there, but become very popular and grandson's done that. Well, they do a very good job. Of okay. They have a song on the, they have a song on the suicide uh, squad soundtrack as well, but the song oh. that got me into them was bury me face down. It's a great fucking song. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had some of the younger bands on too, but I, I agree. I see what you're saying. Like, because I, I don't say that rock is dead, but it's just, it's not going to be, like you said, right. mainstream. I, I think that's a fair thing to say because, yeah, I think Greta Van Fleet can get big, but yeah, I don't know that they're ever going to sell out arenas. I don't know that right. rock will ever, I mean, but then again, I see, I, I see so many of these kids when I used to work in education wearing Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses and all these rock band t-shirts. Sure, but the, the, those are touring for different reasons. They yeah. are heritage bands touring on nostalgia. None of them are touring for relevancy. That's yeah. not happening. It's I'm interesting. Not, it's not, you know, you go to, just to bring her up, because she's so popular right now, Olivia Rodrigo. She's the pop star of the year, right? She's right. She's had several huge hits. She is an of the moment star. She's the Lady Gaga of 2021, where mm-hmm. everybody, she's on every radio station. SNL did a uh, a bit on her, like she's that popular. When you go to see a Motley Crue show or or a Guns N' Roses show, you're going for the nostalgia. You're not going for the new music. Mm. For Olivia Rodrigo, all of her songs are new music. Right. You're going for the new music. Right? That's the new so, hot thing. Yeah. Right. If you go to a Guns N' Roses song and they don't play Paradise City, you're going to be fucking pissed. Right. And that song is 30 years old. So. It's a different uh, mentality. It's actually more than 30 years old at this point. But that, that's why I'm saying. But what I think it's cool about rock is that it is very uh, analogous of what it was when I was younger, which is when I was 86, 85, you know, in that era, I was 14, 15. You look and you see the girl at, in high school next to you was, was drawing a Motley Crue logo on their shirt, on their uh, loose leaf book or their whatever. And you're like, oh, she came into wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt. You're like, oh, shit. She also likes rock because it wasn't super mainstream. Hmm. It was on the come up in the in the mid eighties. Yeah, you know, and it, you found people that were as passionate about that music as you. Then for twenty years, it was mainstream, and everybody liked it. 
And it was just a matter of understanding, oh, yeah, everybody likes Guns N' Roses. Everybody likes Poison or whatever. Now it's back to you have to seek it out. And in mm-hmm. a way, those fans are more pure because they're going out to look for it True. as opposed to it just being on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, and, yeah, you've had so many good interviews on your, your podcast. Um, I haven't watched them all, but it's funny because when I first started doing my research for, for you, I was like, I, I, I realized I, I had seen the first thing I'd ever seen that you did was the Sebastian Bach where you made him angry. I was like, oh, yeah. that's this guy. I was like, oh, yeah. my God. Oh, geez, this is him. And yeah. so that was have you made a lot of other rock stars anger? Is that one of the few? No. So actually, I've been I don't want to say I was I, I never used the word friends with rock stars, but I've been casual acquaintances with Sebastian for 30 years. OK, right? he did my uh, the tour bus back in. Nine, maybe 2000. So what is it? Not 30 years. So that's 21 years ago. Right. Yeah. So he did it 21 years ago and we became friendly and he did the show a bunch of times over the years where we we're still, I think, Facebook friends with his real account. I, you know, his actual uh, real last name account. And he didn't unfriend I, you after that. Huh? He, he didn't, didn't unfriend unfri- me. Oh, okay. No, he didn't unfriend me. So maybe he forgive so you. He may, but my feeling was I knew him well enough where I told my producer, Oh, this is not going to make a full hour. There's no way. He's going to get pissed about something hmm. and it won't last long cuz he that look, I give him credit. He still I think he still sounds incredible and he still is who he is and who he was from the early days of Skid Row. He very much is a shoot from the hip in the moment kind of guy. That's who he is, right? And what we were going to do initially the plan The other guys from Skid Row had come in the studio a couple of months prior, back before COVID, and me and Jay tried to sing I Remember You with them. And we I can't sing, as I (laughs) already established, neither Jay, but it was funny. It was terrible, but it was funny. And we were gonna show it to him. And I knew that moment he would bail. He would not find the the humor in it, and he would bail. But I figured that would happen about 40 minutes in. I didn't know the joke that Jay made nine minutes in (laughs) would piss him off enough to just disconnect. Right. Right. And that's another thing. Like when you say something that pisses you off, if he would have said, all right, look, not funny. Let's just move on. It would not have been a story but mm-hmm. because he disconnected. It became, it became a story, you know? And then thankfully, because I know Rob Halford, who the joke was about technically, right. we got him on the following week and told him the joke and he thought it was fucking funny. Yeah. So I felt like I was going to even send that to, to Sebastian to show him, that he overreacted, like it's not going to change his mind, you know. So right. I didn't bother, but uh, I felt we were very vindicated when Halford not only came on and laughed, but now wanted us to put together a um, a roast for Rob Halford. I've been talking back and forth. Yeah, with I heard about that. Yeah, but it just uh, you know, with COVID, we didn't plan. Maybe next year, okay. Once the world is actually open again, we were starting to plan it, and then Delta comes out. I right, forget it. We're going to wait till the world is reopened and maybe we'll do it next year or the year after. Okay. I, did I hear you say, are you a big Queensryche fan? Love Queensryche. Yeah, did you ever interview Jeff favorites. Tate? Many, many times. Yeah. And how did uh, you get uh, along with him? Because I had him on and he just seemed a little uh, cold to me or, or just a little distant. I don't know what the word. What the, he wasn't like nasty to me, but it just seemed like he was kind of like annoyed, like he didn't really want to be there. Well, that might happen sometimes. You might have just catch somebody at a bad time. You know, I've had great rapport with all of the guys in Queensryche over the years. And, uh, and they all have good days and bad days. But I mean, I love that band. I've had great interviews with Jeff. I'm, I'm friends with him and his wife. I think they're both mm. great. And I'm friends with Scott. And, and uh, you know, I just think that even though he's not in the band anymore, I love Scott. I think he's great. I think they're all great guys. Eddie, all of them, all good guys, right? Um, but I think sometimes you just catch someone on a bad day. You know. Oh, so you've never happen. had that kind of interaction with them then, huh? With him, no, okay. never, never with him. No, in fact, I, I would say I got along very well with him over the years. In fact, at M3 one year, we, you know, we hung out for a lot, like most of the entire M3 was him and I hanging out together. Like he just, well, it must be me crazy. then. I must have. <laughs> no, I, again, I think maybe you just caught him on a bad day. Yeah. Know? No, the, the, those are like my two. I had two, I think, I don't know, I've done 168 or something interviews. I think I've only had two that were. We're kind of bad. That one, and then the uh, art from Everclear. Have you ever had any interactions with yeah, him? Yeah, we had we had a good interview with him, but it was oh. uh, short, and it okay. was uh, it was Everclear and Fuel were on tour together, mm. and we went to the venue, Big J and I, and we did like thirty minutes with each of them, and then aired it like as a as a like an on tour special. The two of them, you know, there it was a, early on in the tour, and it was fine. I wouldn't say it was great, but it wasn't like awkward. It was fine. He was, okay. uh, you know. 
I would say like, like I just interviewed Carrot Top uh, two days ago, right? Oh, nice. And that's a big one. It was one. good. It was good. I would say it was good. I didn't feel like, oh my God, that was great. Sometimes you just will connect with someone for whatever reason. You're pacing or they're both, you're both in a good mood. Who the fuck knows? Like we had Our Lady Peace on, Rain, the singer of Our Lady Peace. And it was just such a fluid, great interview. And I don't know why. Hmm. And then two days later, Carrot Top, it was just like, it was good. Like I don't say he's a super nice guy and it was fine. But sometimes things just go better and go worse. I don't know. Who the fuck knows why? <laughs> you know, you and I are similar. We're not, I don't think you're a comic, right? Mm-mm. You're not a comic, right? And no, I'm not very funny. Shit, yeah, neither am I. And we just do a shit ton of research and try to be entertaining. That's right. what we try and do. Exactly. You know? Try to bring up the interesting stuff. What are some of the best interviews that do stand out for you that, besides uh, this Our Lady Peace one? Um, I bring up the same two a lot. And it's because, and it's funny, it's for different reasons, but um, because of such a, uh, respect for the two of them. And I couldn't believe I got to speak with them for an hour. And it's, uh, I always bring the two up. It is Mark Cuban. Oh, I was going to ask and, you about that one. Yeah. And Neil deGrasse Tyson. Those yeah. two. I was going to ask you about both these. At all. <clears throat> what do you say? I was going to ask you about both these anyway. So that's perfect. Oh, yeah. So to me, like, look, I've gotten lucky. I got to interview every, really, somebody in every band, pretty much. If you go to the 80s rock, somebody in every band that I've ever wanted to have on the band. So like, I interviewed someone from Metallica. I would have loved to speak spoken to someone other than Jason, but I was happy to have Jason. You know, yeah. not not other than, but also, you know, mm-hmm. not just Jason. Right? right, James or get Lars. That would have been great. I got you. I interviewed half or more than half of Guns and Roses. Never got Axel, but I got Slash. I got Duff. I got you know. What I mean, so at that point, you can't. I would love to have spoke to Axel. Never got to. So that those kind of. But things, you're but not like, done either. So it's still right, a possibility true. you could get these might, guys, right? right? Right. Right. Of course. But I'm saying so. I with the rock world, there's there's only like specific people in a band that I would still love to have on. Mm-hmm. But almost every band I've ever wanted, almost I got on the show. You know, so that feels great. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you can't. I'll never interview a uh, Stone Temple Pilot singer because he's not around anymore. That sure that didn't happen. You know, but um or Allison Chains. I did have a couple other guys. From, I had the, the current singer from Allison Chains on, which mm. was great. Um, but Mark Cuban. Just a huge fan, you know, fucking love the guy. Big fan of Shark Tank. Knew of him ancillarily prior to Shark Tank. And then it was just a very cool thing. Like the day before, we just get an email. Mark wants to do the show tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And I was like, well, fuck yeah, let's do it, right? And he's in town and let's make it happen. I just did a shit ton of research for a few hours, went in, and then I found out last minute my co-host couldn't do it. I'm like, oh, all right, shit. just me and Mark. Let's just go do it. And you pitched and your was... show. You pitched your show like an yeah. evaluate. You asked him My for network, an evaluation. Yeah. That was pretty yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. And it's great because him and we had Damon John on. They both gave my network the same valuation. So it makes it very easy when you go to investor and say, well, where'd you come up with this? I'm like, well, it can't get better than this. Here's Damon John and Mark Cuban giving us that exact valuation. That's where we got it from. You know? That's pretty. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Was that? And I didn't watch the full interview. I just saw a clip on YouTube. Is it, is it on Spotify? Or uh... well, what happens? The the business model for my network is after it's twenty episodes old, uh, it goes behind a paywall on Gas Digital Network. So the newest twenty oh. episodes are always free. Okay. And then if you want to hear commercial free or watch the video in HD or the whole archives, you have to pay at Gas Digital Network uh, for the, for the sh- older shows. Okay. Uh, and that's just the way the whole network. There's twenty two. Uh, shows on my network and every one of them work along that paradigm so after 20 episodes they go behind a paywall i love um, like what you're doing you're kind of doing this old school howard stern stuff from the 90s like where the, you have all these like crazy things that you guys are doing like you had run dmc judge a rap contest but then even crazier th- this is the one that i thought was really interesting where you do a different drug once a year you try a new drug like yeah, it's, it's hard, like older guys like us that's dangerous isn't it you're doing yeah. edibles and mushrooms for the first time yeah, the first time ever live on air, um, it was uh, edibles first. I blacked out. Mushrooms, Jesus. I, was, I was drooling. Um, <laughs> the third God. one was, uh, uh, Ecstasy? Was, supposed to be, was, was supposed to be Molly. Okay. Molly, but it, it ended up being crystal meth, and I was <gasps> up for three days. It was horrible. Oh, my God. That's scary. Uh, and then we did actual, we bought a drug kit and got actual Molly. And then right before the pandemic, I did cocaine off of a porn star's butt. Because it's funny to say that that's the only time <laughs> I did coke. You know? Jesus. And I've hated all of them. I've never done any of them again. You know, Was it um, scary, like, doing cocaine? See, that always scared me because I, I, I would think it would, like, you know, make your heart race and stuff. And it's, yeah. like, dangerous. So my thought 
in all honesty, I was friendly with um, not to keep name dropping, so I apologize. But no, I love Kevin it. Dubrow, I love the name dropping. <laughs> Kevin Dubrow from Quiet Riot. I yeah. was friendly with. Okay. Right? And literally spoke to him maybe two, three days before he passed. Right. And he, and he died from a cocaine overdose. Yeah. And he was in his fifties. Right. So I'm fifty, doing cocaine for the first time, Ugh. and my psychopathic brain said, "Well, if I die from this." At least I know this episode is going to be really popular. <laughs> so it, it brought me some comfort in that. Plus, I did one line, you know. Okay, yeah. So I mean, the, and I'm in relatively decent shape. Although Kevin was in great shape, but um, in relatively decent shape. So I figured from one line, and we had it like cleaned. It's like good quality coke that was cleaned, meaning they got any, any impurities were taken out. It was very pure coke. So I figured worst case. Maybe I'm gonna just feel like shit, and that's what happened. I felt. I, you I just felt. It. Did you felt like nervous and on edge and stuff, or? You know, it just it made my teeth really dry, and I kept like going like this a lot, like my, huh. my mouth up. I talked even more than I normally do, and I just wasn't happy. And then okay. I drank huh. a lot of alcohol to try and bring me down, and then I just woke up the next day just feeling awful. Oh. That's yeah. See, it's interesting how certain drugs affect certain people. Some people like they try a drug one time, and they're like in love with it you know and it's like they're they're addicted immediately almost like they, it's just like they, they, where have you been all my life kind of thing but it sounds like you're not having those experiences which is good yeah, well also i don't think i have a, a addictive personality plus what a lot of fans have said is you're trying th these drugs in the worst possible scenario <laughs> on air cameras yeah. people were trying to you know go with a girl you love and go try mushrooms in the in the forest and you're gonna love it you know okay but i'm I'm doing them all in the wrong area. I'm, <laughs> that's all right. I don't want to love it. So it works out fine for me, yeah. you know? Um, and then when we had uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson on, my first question to him was, I know everything about you. I gave him a whole credit list. Of, uh, why the fuck would you come on a show called Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll? Right? Yeah, why would he? And he said a great answer, which was, when I go on science shows, I know everybody's on board already. Mm -hmm. But if I come on a show like this, maybe I'm going to change a few minds. Mm. And that's why I want to do, do shows like this. I'm like, well, that's a great answer. Question number two, what kind of stupid middle name is DeGrass? And he had a good answer for that, too. What did he say about that? You know, it, it ties back to some sort of military thing where a, a General DeGrass who worked for the French helped the United States during our independence from, from Britain. Okay. And then he got arrested and was brought into somewhere in the Caribbean, and a lot of people took his name for honoring what he did for America, and his grandfather gave him that middle name. Okay, that's awesome. So, yeah, I, I'm trying to branch out as well. I mean, I've had a lot of the musicians, but I'm trying to get, you know, I had yesterday I had a paranormal investigator on, so I, I like you doing... A social and instant, like a YouTube guy you had on recently. Yeah, 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 social like... marketing guy. Just so I like yeah. learning about tons of different things. Do you feel the same way, too? Also, as you, the older you get, you've, you've interviewed these musicians so many times, it's fun to like try to interview someone else and try to branch out and learn about something else. True. What the funny thing is this, is that I feel, and I'm sure you feel the same way, if you're only defined by one thing, you're a fucking boring dude. So it's okay mm -hmm. to love food, love science, love music, love this. Love, you should have various aspects to your personality. Mm -hmm. And that's very much me. I've always been a fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson for 30 years. Yeah. So, or 20 years. Like whenever... Whenever uh, Pluto got delisted and no longer a planet is when I found out about him, and I've been following him ever since. I don't know how many years ago that is. But what happens, which is unfortunate for us, is when we bring on these other people, the show doesn't do as well. I thought the Mark Cuban yeah. episode would be the most listened to episode ever. It didn't do that well. Right. You know, same thing with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Then, last week on the show, we do one of our stupid little games. We did the butthole beauty battle <laughs> where three porn stars come in and we judge how pretty their butts were. And I got woke up to like 5,000 notifications. Like, how great they might. Everyone loved that show. Yeah. This is what SDR is all about. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, you guys, like, fucking expand your horizons a little bit. Like, we're doing some great interviews here. Yeah. Well, no, that's like when I had the social media guy on, we talked about that. It's like, you know, it's branding and like your niche and like people, you know, you should be known for a niche. And I was like, well, yeah, but like if you look at rock music guys, right. Uh, you know, it's like the, the ceiling is like probably Eddie trunk, right? He's the number one podcast for rock music. He's got like, I don't know, 300,000 followers, but then you look at the ceiling for just, if you have a variety, like, you know, like what you and I want to do, that's like Joe Rogan. I mean, he's got millions. Yeah. So, but right. I guess he's I Joe Rogan. So, yeah, I just, I, I also, it's not even about that. Like I, 
if you can offer me to switch places with Eddie Trunk and be known as the rock guy and just that. Mm-hmm. I did the, my, my co-host on, not my co-host, but my business partner for the network is a comic and he's way more famous than me, far more followers, blah, blah, blah. But I wouldn't want to be known as he is known. I wouldn't want to be known as Eddie Trunk is known. I want to be known for who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. And if that means I only have 13,000 or 14,000 Instagram followers versus his 300,000, I'm fine with it. You know, it doesn't bother me. I, I would rather be comfortable with who I am and not just be known as the rock guy. I, I wouldn't want to do it. And I've always felt that way. I didn't want to sell out and be just, you know, like I, I know that um, I could have stuck to my guns a lot with our show and only play hair metal and nothing else. But mm-hmm. I like other aspects of rock. Yeah. So, you know, I want to be known for playing. other. Int- maybe I introduced a few people to bands I never heard of. You know, so that's what I wanted to do back then. And same thing with... Uh, with what we do now, I bring on people sometimes that I just think are going to have a good story. And mm-hmm. it may not be the most listened to episode. Yeah. I, I'm bringing on a rapper next week. I don't know shit about him. But he, I saw a couple of his songs. I like him. He seemed like an interesting dude. I'm like, our fans are probably not going to love it. But I think he's going to have an interesting story. So let's fucking bring him on. Yeah. No, and I don't even think, like, when you say Eddie Trunk's selling out, like, I think, I don't think Eddie not, Trunk no, is no, selling no, out. Eddie Trunk is selling. Yeah, because I think is, is I think for him like he that is him like he he really does only love rock. But I'm like see I think I'm mean. more like you. I, I like a variety. I like other kinds of music. I like movies you know, and that's TV. What I mean, I, yeah. I wouldn't want to be just that. Right. What I mean exactly. I no, because I I'd feel like I'm selling out if I exactly. I no, I agree. That's that's the same thing. You know what's interesting too is I find that sometimes like your most popular episodes it has to do with if the guest shares it. Like if Mark Cuban had shared yeah, that know. interview yeah. on his social oh media. God. That would have yeah. been a lot different. Yeah, it's, I always assume they're not going to share it right. because the they can't share every interview they do. Sure, you know? I was happy Buck Cherry shared the interview we just had on. I didn't think oh. they would do that. Wow! Not only Buck Cherry and Josh Todd both shared it separately. I'm like, well, that's wow. fucking cool. That's you know? really so cool. That, and so when I see that, I'm like, wow, that's nice. You know, like just like back in the day, the only thing that mattered to me in the radio show is when the band would thank me on stage. Like, I just would love them to say thanks to the tour bus. Not me, per the name of my show, the tour bus. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, that was like the end-all, be-all for me. They, they mentioned my show. It just was like a way of like, I was like, all right, good. We mattered to them, you know? And so that's when I look at when somebody does reshare my interview. I was like, oh, shit. So that kind of mattered to them. But the difference is these days, we're all doing so much shit. You can't share everything there. The Buck Cherry news feed would be a barrage of interviews. <laughs> And that's it. That's and true. Like, yeah. I don't fucking follow this anymore. So they have to be selective. I get it. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I think one of my most popular episodes, at least on YouTube, was uh, Rachel Bolin from Skid Row. He and he shared mm-hmm. it, and that's why it's so popular. And it's like, yeah. wow. And I, I, he doesn't share every episode, but I, I'm such a diehard Skid Row fan. He must have picked up on that. Yeah, they're all good guys. Rachel's a great guy. They're, David's a great guy. They're just those are solid guys. You know, Sabo was playing guitar while we were butchering I Remember You. And I mean, just the fact that he would do that, <laughs> yeah, you know, it just made me laugh. So like, this guy made his millions from this song and we're destroying it. <laughs> and he's, he's like, oh, that was almost yeah. good. Like he was, he was really having fun with it, which really makes me happy. You know? Yeah, I think it's funny that um, I was trying to figure out, because like on your Instagram, you have your um, the SDR podcast page but it's like blanked out. And I was like, wait, did their pan- their page get we banned? And then I yeah. learned the page was banned, but it's banned for the dumbest reason because Phil, uh, Phil from Def Leppard showed his abs. Yeah, yeah. What? I, I how, guess what? my publicist told you that. I don't know how else you fucking knew that. I heard you never, talking about an interview. Uh, I think. Yeah. yeah, we got banned because Phil from Def Leppard showed his abs. Somebody marked it as offensive. We had been to, uh, reported before. And you get three strikes, and that was our third strike. So can that people was, report anything, though? I So I don't know enough about it, to be honest with you, <clears throat> you know? Mm. Um, That's weird. Yeah. Do you think Can you um, get it back at some point, though, or on, on probation, or is it just gone forever? I, we're fighting it right now. Because that's scary. If you, I mean, if you build something up over years, and you have thousands of followers, and then they could just take it away in a second? Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't even, from my knowledge, because I have someone um, that runs it, they said, we didn't even get a warning. We didn't get a notification. We just woke up and it was gone. And we've been fighting it. But And this guy works with a lot of shows. He said it could take up to a year to get an answer. Jesus. So, there's, so, there's, so many, um, uh, <laughs> there's so many Instagram handles. That, how many people can they look at it a day? But we're fighting it. And I know somebody that knows somebody at Instagram. Hmm. 
So I'm trying to get through that through that way, but it's been hard to get in touch with that dude. So I'm hoping that he can maybe at least put in a good word for us. That seems you know? so fucked up. Like, so what are your thoughts on cancel culture? Because I just saw this today. Um, we were joking. Uh, we just had our fantasy football draft, and my my friend is a uh, Washington football team fan, and he's got the jersey, and he's got black tape over where it says Redskins. And I was, and then so I was like, yeah, it seems like they're canceling everything. I was like, I hope they don't cancel the Notre Dame fighting Irish mascot. I'm Irish and I love that mascot. And I just saw today that there was a survey done that they find the leprechaun offensive. It's the fourth most offensive mascot. And so number one, now that the Redskins are gone, uh, it's, it's all the other native American ones. I think Uh, I thought the Indians are gone too. Aren't they gone? Yeah, but there's like, I think the Florida state Seminoles and there's somebody's Aztec warriors. I don't even know what, if it's a school or what. So here's my brilliant idea. Okay. It's very simple. Okay. On, on all social media platforms, in your settings, you have a test, a, a, a tick mark that says, I don't mind offensive content, I mind offensive content. You turn it on, you turn it off. As a poster, you have to tag it as potentially offensive or not offensive. Okay. And if it's, hmm. then it filters out accordingly. There should still be some guidelines, no murder, no whatever, you know, certain guidelines on either side. But I think that would filter out 90% of the problems. Hmm. If you don't want to see it, you just turn that on. You don't see it. It would make everyone's lives a lot easier. To me, if it's it's a weird thing, I've had this argument a lot because I think if it's done in the pr- purpose of comedy, anything should be allowed. I really believe that. But mm-hmm. then it becomes weird because what defines comedy? You know, then you know, I think it's all... Like, some people say, well, if you're a comedian, you know, it's a joke. But what defines a comedian these days? It's not... Is it saying just stand-up comedians? Now you're getting into weird category they better Mm -hmm. than everybody else like it starts becoming a slipperier and slipperier slope so very often you say well what about context but context could be done looked at very differently from different eyes there is no easy answer to it Mm -hmm. but i think saying i don't want to see it anything potentially offensive and then you could say i find this subject matter offensive and then that whatever that is you're not going to see that type of thing again Mm -hmm. and it just that's the way to handle it Instead of trying to get rid of everybody. Yeah, I can't, can't believe they would it. cancel your whole page. Right. They can't That's find crazy. a Jeopardy host because you go back in anyone's life, there's going to be one tweet that somebody finds offensive. Right. But I, I also think it's like, what's your intent? Like, if you maybe you said something you were mad at, at the moment, do you really yeah. hate this group or, you know, do you like you made a joke, but do you really deep down hate those people? I mean, I don't know. That's just my theory a, behind the whole there, thing. There's a, um, a politician, and I forget his name right now, and I'm sorry that I forget his name, but he was a card-carrying member of the KKK. He was a very racist person. Sure, right? B- Bird. I think his name was yeah, Bird. Robert Bird or Robert Bird. Right. Is that his name? Yeah. But then the guy that died, he and had then a he spiritual spiritual yeah. awakening, mm-hmm. realized he was wrong, and for 20 years, all he did was try to advance equal rights. And at his funeral, Obama spoke, Oprah spoke, the NAACP honored him. Right. If he got canceled 20 years prior, none of that good would have happened. That's a good point. That's a real, yeah. Why can't people change or grow? I mean, I know I'm a totally different person than I was 20 years ago, even five years ago. Right. So I think that you need to look at the body of work, not just the person. And especially deep diving to a decade ago and saying, well, that offends me. The, the, the argument I say is if you don't think 20 years from now, people are going to say he ate an animal? Are you kidding me? We don't eat animals anymore. We all have synthetic meat. He have a picture of him carving a turkey? Oh, my God. We have to cancel him. It's going to happen. Something like that. Something like that, that the, for sure. Or that standard, exact thing. Yeah. That they can't believe, oh, my God, he used to eat raw. What? Like, what? We don't do that anymore. And then people are going to cancel that. But, like, people want to blame uh, Christopher Columbus. It's now um, uh, Indigenous People's Day, right? Mm-hmm. So they can't call it Columbus anymore. What he did, it's not like they were like, oh, my God, this guy Columbus, he went batshit crazy. He just started killing people. He was there for a mission. That's what he was supposed to do. He was, it was welcomed. that they, they all did that. Cortez did it. Burn the fucking ships. We're not coming back. We're killing everybody. Right? So those people weren't lunatics. They were just doing what everybody else was doing. Mm-hmm. Now they're looked at as a lunatic, but at the time it was endorsed. So right. I think like it, you can't hold people up from decades ago to the standards of today because they're always going to change. Right. Well, I think we should learn from the history for yeah, sure, but we can't person. erase it. Right. I just, I, yeah. I don't, I don't get it. Like I look at things that I did when I was a kid, I would never do them now. And I think most of us feel that way, you know, about everything in life. 
So you're allowed to evolve and be a better person and then be honored or not honored or accepted for the new you or who you are now. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, it's all the crazy shit that you guys do on your show. I thought this was a cool story too, that you guys once had this girl in and she was like going to be a porn star or something. And then, um, I guess the episode made it to her little brother's high school and he find out and he threatened suicide. So you said, Hey, no problem. We're going to take this down. Like that shows to me, like you're a good guy. Like whether you can, I would never, I felt horrible. And also yeah. I said, look, we can take it down. But understand that people can download it and they have it. Right. I can't do that, but I can do what but I. But you're can doing do your it. best. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't exist on my side anywhere. Yeah. You know. There's, there's, so. Because when what you. I can do. Yeah. When you make an episode like that, you're making it for fun. You guys are trying to have a good time. You don't want bad outcomes. So I mean, right. again, that goes back to the intent of people. And I think most people that I talk to, you know, nobody's perfect, but most people are, are deep down good people. Want to help people. Want to do good for Most the world. People. I think and I think that's why like libertarianism doesn't work because I don't think all people inherently care about the greater good or, or are generally good people in a society where most people don't return their shopping carts. <laughs> you know, we can't expect people yeah. to always do the right thing. Well, some so, people need a little push or a little right. nudge of some sort that's or some, some help in the right them. direction. Yeah. Some little guidelines say this is what you got to do. You got to have some. Part. Yeah. You got to have something. You can't just have a yeah. free. You can't have anarchy. For sure. Right. That's what I. That's how I feel. That not everybody needs a little nudge for yeah. for certain reasons. We'd all be running lights if we knew that it was completely nobody cared. You know, the idea of a ticket is enough that you stop. It's called like what is it? Uh, Khan's categorical imperative is the is the term where we all follow certain guidelines. Like you don't see a cop, but just the concept of it uh, is enough to stay at the red light. You know, that's why you don't go forward. Mm -hmm. So that's how society functions is because of these universal truths that we all just accept. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, I um, mean, you have another podcast. Oh, you know what else I was going to ask you about before we get to your other podcast? Um, who made the trailer for the for the SDR podcast? Because that is a great, the reel that oh, you guys put together. Yeah, it's a great reel, yeah. One of my one of the guys on my team, just I, you know, we, I just had him do it. It's a great, uh, I've said we need something to capture what this show is about uh, in under a minute. And he worked on it for a while. We tweaked it back and forth. And I was like, man, this is it. Let's not change a thing. The only thing I added was if you watch it at the end, Ronnie Radke from uh, Falling in Reverse says, you did cocaine on the show? What? <laughs> and that was the end, of the, the end of the trailer. It comes back after the credit. It comes back like a last minute thing. It's funny. Yeah, you but, have. Um, so because you guys have like a pretty big production team. It's not just like because yeah. most of these podcasts, a lot of like mine, it's just, it's just me. And like so my girlfriend helps me out a little bit. But you guys have like a full team that's helping you out, right? Well, the network has grown. You know, yeah, I started that's the cool. network with four shows and one producer. And now we have, you know, include 22 shows, 16 producers, an ad sales team, a, a merchandising team. You know, we'll, we're doing 4 million listeners a week on the network or something like wow. that across the network. I don't know exact numbers, but a couple of million for sure each week. Uh, we sell ads for dozens of shows that are not even on the network. You know, we, we sell ads for Barbara Corcoran. We sold ads for Mike Tyson, like... We, we have a whole ad sales team that's a separate company. We do thousands of dollars a month in rentals uh, for the studios. The, the Sopranos guys were renting our studio for well, up until like maybe two months ago. They do a Talking Sopranos podcast, Michael Imperioli and Steve Sherpa, and they were using our studios because we have two studios in our location uh, there. I do this at home. I have the small studio here, mm. um, but um, we have two big studios at the, at the – uh, at the guest digital studio. Yeah, that's really cool. And then you have, so you're, this other interest uh, that you have is kind of health and wellness and you have the good sugar podcast and then this book, which I, I was going to order, but then it said it wouldn't come for like a week, but I was reading the reviews and I, and I was also kind of hesitant because I was like, wait, is this a real book? Cause it says it is not. Okay. Is it just one of those things where it's like a funny title and then it's just like you open well, it up. I'll show it to you right here. I'll okay. hold it up for your video. Yeah. So that's it's what it's the 100% guaranteed guide to weight loss and fitness. And I stand by this. I will give you your money back <laughs> if you follow my my goals, you follow my book, and you don't do it, yeah. it doesn't work for you, I'll give you your money back. There's only two pages. Chapter one is eat less. Yes. Chapter two is work out more. And then the rest of the book is blank. Okay, so that's what I thought. I was like, I think it's one of those joke book things. That I was like, I don't know, because I was reading the reviews, and I was like, what, seriously? Is this a joke? But then other people were like, they were in on the joke and they were writing reviews for you. They were like, this is great stuff. This was so funny. I love the way it was written. And I was like, okay, wait, I'm suspicious of this. Yeah, so it sold well though. We got to number 77 on Amazon, which is great, you know, but um, Damn, that's amazing. I really pushed it last year, right before Christmas. It was a great stocking stuff for Yes. Good for gift. Christmas, right? Good joke gift. And um, what happened was on the Good Sugar podcast, we bring in all these different health and wellness experts. And one day I just started laughing to myself. I was like, you boil it down. 
And really, they're all just saying eat less and work out more. That's really, there might be different ways. Eat this at this time, do this then, work out then, tr- shock your body, trick you, whatever. Eat less and work out more, you're going to get into good shape. That's it. You're eating a 15-ounce steak every day, eat a 10-ounce steak every day. You're going to notice a difference. That's just what's going to happen. You're doing no push-ups, do one push-up. <laughs> and every day, you soon you're going to start feeling a difference. And that's mm-hmm. the philosophy that I go on. My father passed away about five years ago. And I gained like 60 pounds, 70 pounds. I got really fat, right? Mm. And there's videos of me on on YouTube when I started being, oh, my God, the barrage of you fat fuck emails that I was getting. People love to make fun of you when you're, you know, they love to kick you when you're down. Jesus, um, that's sad. That's fine. You know, whatever. It's part of our (laughs) fandom. It's totally fine. But uh, during the pandemic, I was like, okay, I have time. Let's start changing. So I started running. And I started, we started the podcast about a year year and changing right before the pandemic. And I used it all to lose. I think I lost 55 pounds already. And I'm nice. now I, I had never run a mile in my, if you add it up every time I ran in my life, it was less than a mile together, maybe a mile and a half. And now I'm running 22 miles a week, every week. Wow. You that's know, a lot. I've, I've run two half marathons already. And I'm going to do another one in uh, February and another one in, in April. I run uh, a four, a seven and a 10 every week. And then like a little bit more, a little less here and there. So it comes out wow. to 21, 22 miles a week. I have a Peloton right here off camera. I use that every day. I do yoga every day. I'm working out with a trainer every day, well, three days a week on, on all those. So I've changed my life and I've gotten feeling much better, have much more energy. And it really comes down to eat less and work out more. Well, that's great. That's really inspiring, though. Do you ever like uh, follow David Goggins? Have you ever seen any of his videos and stuff? No. Oh, God, you should check him out. He's like, he's, he's so intense, man. He's all about like, you know, he lost, he was at 300 pounds almost. He lost a bunch of weight. He's a Navy SEAL. He's been on Rogan a bunch. So you should try to get him on your podcast. Yeah. Is he a black guy? Yeah. Yeah. I have seen him. Yeah. He's cool. Yeah. He's He's crazy. He's been really motivated. I was like, I need to start working out more. Like, I I don't think I could go to that level because he's insane. But well, that's the problem I think everybody makes is they look at these people and think, oh my God, how I can't do that. But that's why I say, I started doing this, this app called Couch to a 5K, which is a simple, you're on a couch, let's get you to running 5K, which is about three miles, right? And it takes nine weeks, hmm. and you just listen in your headphones, and you start out with 20-second intervals of running for like 10 minutes. Hmm. And then it just slowly builds and slowly builds. And I, I'm a huge advocate of starting very, very small micro changes, baby steps. That, that's what's going to make a difference. If you stay today, that's it. I'm only eating salad, nothing else. I'm going to do 100 push-ups a day. That's it. You'll yeah. be done in a week and you'll be miserable and you'll never go back. So just do a little bit at a time. That's all I that think matters. that, yeah, that actually works for, that's a good uh, advice for success in any field and doing anything. Yeah. You look at our, these podcasts that you and I do, right. And people say, I need to get the artwork. I need to f- get on every channel. I need to bring in video and do YouTube. I need a theme song. I need that. And you start to do, should I have a Patreon? Blah, blah, blah. Start a fucking podcast. Just do one. Right. You don't need it. Download Anchor. You can do it with your do phone. It your phone. Yeah. yeah, do it on your phone with Anchor for free. Do five of them and see if you still want to do it before you spend $500 on a mic. You're like, just calm down. Exactly. No, I agree. Um, well, so is there anything else that's left for you to do? I mean, I know you want to uh, interview Axel. And uh, I think you had some other ones. James Hetfield, David Lee Roth, Charlie Sheen. Is yeah. there other people you want to interview or other things you want to accomplish? I would. So my show, which... I, twice hit number one in comedy in iTunes, right? It hit number 11 overall once. That was the highest we ever got. Um, we got shadow banned, which is annoying. That happens once in a while. Like, you know, things happen. People may have complained about the content. I don't fucking know. Right? Huh. But um, I would love to see it get back in the charts. On the co- We're on the comedy interview charts all the time, huh. right? Okay. But the regular comedy charts, which is a subset, com- the comedy interview is a subset of comedy, you know? So you could be number one in comedy interview, but you might only be a hundred on comedy, you know, whatever, however it works, right? Okay. I'd love to see the show get back onto the comedy charts. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I'd love that to happen. I'm fine with it being just in comedy interview. That's what happens. It's still something, right? Yeah. I don't know. Charts shouldn't matter, but sometimes it just matters. I'd love to double our numbers. That's what I look at it. You know, you're never happy. Yeah. I remember talking to a guy who had like 200,000 views on his YouTube videos, right? And I was like, dude, I got a, he's a comedy, comic friend of mine. I don't want to say his name. I don't want to throw him under the bus for this comment. But they like, dude, fucking man, congratulations. Your show's doing great. And his response was, I don't know, fucking Joe Rogan gets 20 million per view. So am I doing great? You know, I was like, so no matter how good you're doing, 
you're always there's always somebody doing better. So just be happy with where you're at. You know, if you have ten thousand listeners to your podcast, there's somebody with eighty listeners that would give their left arm for those ten thousand, mm-hmm. and you're like, well, why don't I have a hundred thousand? Right. So it just it you're never happy, and you should never be happy. You should always be striving to do better. But what I've tried to do now more than ever, partly because of Good Sugar Podcast and the where I met, just being in the moment and being fucking happy with what you have. You know, when is enough enough? You know, that's the question. I forget who said that, but I'm pretty content with where we are. Of course, I'd love things to keep going in the right direction, but I'm pretty content. Like, if, it, if this is where it is, I'm happy with where, where we are. You know, I've, I've carved out my cute little niche. Yeah, you've done a lot more than I have. I mean, just the Mark Cuban and Sebastian Bach, those are two that I would love to have on my show. So that's really well, cool. Don't tell Sebastian you know me because that ain't going to help your interviews at all. Don't yeah, no, know. no. I think I, I may have a connection there. So I think, oh, you're friends with us. Who are some other rock stars you're friends with? I, I heard you say Bumblefoot and uh, comedian Glover. Craig Gass. And- Craig Gass, Corey Glover, I'm a bunch. You know, I know a lot of them. You know, I've been doing this for a long fucking time. Uh, I saw you at D Snyder. I'm friends with D. Uh, oh, JJ. okay. Oh, I mean, a bunch of guys. It's been a... I've been doing this a long, a, a long time. So you, you tend to, none of them I would say, by the way, other than Corey, I would say Corey Glover, definitely friends. Okay. Most of them, we are casual acquaintances. Fair you know, enough. Like I remember, yeah. it was a funny, stupid story. I went to a friend's wedding in um, Vegas. This is 10 years ago, right? I didn't know anybody else there. I just knew him and the, and the, and the, the bride and the groom, and I was there with a bunch of people I didn't know. And we're sitting at, a, I think it was the, the Hard Rock or whatever, and most of the people were roughly my age, or give or take. And Vince Neal walks by with a, two girls, right? He's walking by. And everyone's like, holy shit, it's Vince Neal. And he just comes up. He goes, hey, Ralph, what's up? And gives me a high five. I'm like, hey, good to see you. I'm actually here for a wedding. He's like, all right, cool, man. Be good. And he walked away. And they're all like, who the fuck are you? Like, <laughs> what, how the fuck is that him? You know? And so that's funny to me. Those kind of yeah. things. You know, uh, one of the other one time fucking David Coverdale opened when uh, Whitesnake Judas Priest were on tour. And we were at, I was like fourth or fifth row watching Whitesnake. He just starts talking to me from the stage, <laughs> you know, like having a conversation. Hey, That's you, awesome. I'm like, yeah, hey, good to see you. It's like, oh, come back after the stage. Like, cool, man. And everyone around me was like, who the fuck, what the fuck are you? You're nobody. Yeah. What's going on here? You know? So those moments are the ones that I'm like, oh my God, that's like the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, to me too. I think that's super cool. You say like, oh, I don't want to name drop. I'm like, I love hearing the name drops because I'm interested in this this field and these people, like people that are successful and interesting and do amazing things like be rock stars. Cause I have no musical talent. So for me to see them do that, I'm like, that's amazing. Find the video of me singing. I remember you and you will see, I also have no musical talent. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Is there anything else I miss? Anything else you want to promote or? Uh, it's very simple. Follow me everywhere at I am Ralph Sutton. I am Ralph Sutton. And that is across all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you, YouTube, I don't really post. I mean, I'm really on Instagram. I just added TikTok because I feel you have to. I have a whopping 100 fans. On TikTok, <laughs> I'll follow you on but, TikTok. Let's follow yeah, each other. Follow, yeah, I'll follow, we'll follow each other on TikTok. I don't know if we follow each other on Instagram, but I'll follow you on, t- on Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. I follow you. I don't know. You don't follow me. Uh, I'll, look, I'll look up. I'll follow you back. <laughs> I'm used to but, not um, being followed back. It's okay. <laughs> I'll follow you back. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, and just listen to the show. I, all I care about with, with SDR and Good Sugar, just listen to the show. You don't need to subscribe or pay at Gas Digital or whatever, just listen to the show and enjoy it for the nonsense that it is and just have fun. That's all yeah. I care about. Well, no, and I, I the SDR is YouTube, but it's got like 85,000 or, uh, yeah, 85,000 subscribers, something like that. So I, I there's really a lot of it. clips. Like, And my thing is, like, there's so many podcasts out there. I don't have time to listen to every podcast, but I have time to listen to clips, and I have time to listen to certain episodes that I, you know, even like yeah. Howard Stern and Joe Rogan, who I love, I can't, I just don't have time to catch every one of their episodes, especially the three hours, but like there's certain, like the Ro- one of the Rogan episodes where you just had the girl from North Korea. I don't know if you heard that one. That was mind boggling. That was that several of my friends have done Joe Rogan. I've never done it. Right. I wish I could, but I've never, I doubt he'll ever ask me, but, um, your friends I've have done Joe, like comedians or, Oh yeah. Uh, Big J, my co-host has okay. done it a bunch of times. Oh. Um, Michael Malice, who's on my network, done a bunch of time. Tim Dillon, who started at my Love network. Love Tim Dillon, bunch, yeah. He started on my network. He, you know, a good friend of mine. He started on my network. Wow. Um, he's done it a bunch of times. Um, I have never made it. Oh, Mark Norman. You know, a lot, a lot of Oh, I love him. He was on my show. Yeah. Uh, I've never made it through a full episode of any of them because it's three fucking hours. I, who the fuck <laughs> has that kind of time? You know? Right. Yeah, well, I, that, I listened to someone. I was, on a, I was just on a big road trip 
uh, for the Rockin' Pod. Did you, you you never went to that one, have you? I've been offered to go. Okay. I, I don't mean to shit on anything, but if you're, and this sounds so fucking douchey, so I apologize, Chuck. No, no, but no. if you're asking me to go for a weekend and you're not paying me to go, I can't do it. It just doesn't right. make sense for me. You know, like, that makes I, sense. I appreciate it, but if you're at least going to make me a featured speaker and mm -hmm. pay me, I'm not going to go just to press hands with other podcasters. I appreciate it, but and they've offered me to go. And I, I know the guys that have put it on. Yeah, I, I just can't. I can't. You know, I mean. So they offered you to go, but they they wouldn't put you up in the hotel, and and not pay me. So you is know, that so the people that are speakers or did they not did they just do it know. themselves? Maybe they just. I, I don't Maybe they had a different deal. They offered other people. Okay. What I'm saying is like, if you don't think me having four million listeners and having tens of thousands of paid subscribers doesn't warrant speaking at a at a at one of these things in this field mm -hmm. and my 20 year history in a radio show yeah that at 100 then i i i can't i don't know what to tell you i'm not coming i don't mean to be a dick about it but i appreciate the offer <laughs> to just go and, and hang out with people but i'm yeah. not i'm not doing it it is fun though yeah i mean but uh, i totally understand that that makes sense well cool well uh, uh oh i always like to end each episode with a charity i don't know if your pr person told you is there a charity that you like to support or throw uh just a you know, quick I'll shout out to one just because um What's his name? Um, Caratop mentioned he does a lot of work with them. And I, I'll just mention that when I asked him, did he pick it because he got mistaken for him a lot of times? It's Ronald McDonald House. <laughs> almost exactly his name. And he said he does a lot of work with them. So okay. I don't have a specific charity. I used to work with Cancer Sucks when I was on the um, boat as their auctioneer. Okay. I did that for a bunch of years, but I wasn't on last year. But I, they're a great charity also. So okay. I'll mention both those. Cool. Cancer perfect. Sucks I'll put that in the notes. I'll put your website in there. And then, yeah, if people want to. Um, throw a few bucks to the charity. I always try to just do something at the end here to make the world better since we're... And it is a charity for me if to go fund me to go to uh, Ukraine and sleep with foreign prostitutes. You can invest there. I'm just I can't tell if you're joking or not. Because <laughs> you guys do so much crazy shit. I'm like, maybe there is... Wasn't there we a did thing... We go fund me for, for our producer, Shannon, to fly to Italy to, to have sex with a male porn star that she was in love with. He agreed to do it, but then he disappeared. Like, we were going to bring him on. We set up the channel... We started getting funds in, and then he was going to come on and talk about it, and then he bailed. But she was going to fly. She's a, the, Her only porn star crush is this big diesel dude named Rob Diesel, and we were going to fly her out to have sex with him. And then the guy bailed on us. It was so weird. Yeah, and I heard you say there was like another thing you were doing. You were going to have a $100 hooker and a $1,000 hooker we and see that. if somebody... Did you did that yeah, one. That okay. Was the, that was the Or Olympics where we hired a $100 escort. And a thousand dollar escort, and we got blindfolded one minute blowjobs. Yeah. to see if it's worth the extra nine hundred. So could they tell the difference? We, we we did it. I picked both. Jay and I did it, and okay, we both picked the hundred dollar escort. Really? When you when you take out, the, you can't see them, you uh, can't touch them. Huh. Your hands are behind your back. You're just blindfolded, and for one minute, each of them did oral on us, and then we had to say, did you like A or B better? We didn't know who was A, yeah, who was B, yeah. and we both picked the the girl that was the hundred dollar girl. Crazy. All right. Well, yeah, I'll have to check out more of your content. It sounds hilarious. So thanks tonight so much. We have a mother, tonight we have a mother and daughter uh, porn. I don't know if they're porn stars or whatever, but it's a gorgeous woman. She, her name is Victoria Zadrock. She's the only, one of the few women that was featured in Playboy and Penthouse. Oh. She got married. She was out of the game. She's getting back into like, I don't know what you call it, cam modeling or whatever. And now she's trying to talk. She's getting her daughter into it, who's 19 years old. And they're coming in together tonight. I'm like, this is going to be a fucking weird episode. <laughs> but I'm down. How are you guys not canceled yet? This is wait. I mean, you, <laughs> you, the Def Leppard's abs gets you canceled, but this yeah. doesn't. Okay. Well, we'll, we always severely edit these. Oh, know? okay. And they sure. go, the clips go on. It's all you have to pay online to see anything really. The bad. paywall, yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, thanks, Ralph. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, buddy. All right. I'll talk to you later. Ralph Sutton, check out his podcast, The SDR Show, or for health and wellness tips, you can listen to the Good Sugar Podcast. And as he said, you can follow him on social media to keep up with what he's doing. Uh, follow me too, and you can subscribe to both of our YouTube channels. And again, I'm really trying to get to that 1,000 subscriber mark, and I think we're going to get there with your support. Uh, your comments, likes, and shares mean so much to me. So for those of you doing that, please know that I really appreciate you and your support. It really means the world to me. So have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.